Okay. Good afternoon, um, all participants. I am uh, Raquel Gonzalez with the California CC, and I'm very excited to present our um, panel, well, to present Dr. Montoya, who will be speaking to you about um, English learners' disabilities. So Dr. Um, Deborah Escalante Montoya is a senior director for the Imperial County CELPA. Dr. Montoya has over 19 years of experience working with and leading programs for students with disabilities. Dr. Montoya is a strong advocate for students with disabilities and English language learners. She believes in the important work of educators and the array of opportunities they can provide to ensure equitable and accessible learning environments for each student. Dr. Montoya has worked as a school psychologist, principal, director of special education and support services prior to her role as a SELPA senior director. At the present time, she is leading the SELPA content lead work, improving outcomes for students with disabilities who are English learners. In partnership with the California Department of Education and the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence. Welcome, Dr. Montoya. We are very excited um, and uh, excited to hear your words uh, in this presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez, and thank you to the California CEC for the invitation to present. And absolutely thankful for all of the participants who have logged on at this time uh, to join us, especially as we know that it's difficult amidst all the work that you have in this pandemic to take time out of your day to share in the passion that we have for this work, which is improving outcomes for English learners with disabilities. I have my colleagues with me as well, and I'm very excited to introduce them to you. As they work in support, the three of us lead our team. As a SELPA content lead, I have Lupita Olin Rubio with me, Inclusionary Practices Coordinator for the Imperial County SELPA, with over 18 years of experience as a curriculum coordinator, providing professional development on literacy and language and development for English learners at the Imperial County Office of Ed. So I'm very pleased that she has joined our SELPA team. And as we work together to provide and disseminate information and professional development as you're participating today regarding the California Practitioner's Guide for Educating English Learners with Disabilities. And we also have Vanessa Lopez, who is part of our team, Inclusionary Practices Coordinator for Imperial County SELPA, who also supports and assists our work as we try to assist those districts, SELPAs, county offices, higher education as well in this work and in our charge in California. Vanessa has over 18 years of experience as a special education teacher, as an English learner coach, and her passion for assistive technology and supporting equity and access. Again, we're proud to have her on our team at the Imperial County SELPA. So together, the three of us will be presenting to you regarding improving outcomes for English learners with disabilities. We have a very short time together with two hours uh, to walk you through the California Practitioner's Guide for Educating English Learners. And although we can't see you and interact with you, we do hope that you connect with us via the chat box. So feel free to answer any questions you have in our chat box. Um, and you will receive the Padlet for you to use and reuse any of the resources. The QR link is on your screen now. And we will begin with our presentation of an introduction to the California Practitioner's Guide for Educating English Learners with Disabilities. So I will share with you that again, the three of us are here to help and assist and support. You have access to our direct emails because we want to ensure that we're accessible to the field with any questions that you have. But I did want to launch a poll to get an idea of who's participating with us today. I'm going to launch a poll to identify which roles you most identify with. So please take a quick moment to enter the poll. Okay, we have about 80% of our respondents 
having participated. I'll give it a few more seconds as I see many of you responding. And thank you again. Thank you for taking time out of your very busy day. Okay, with about 90% having responded, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. And we have the majority of special education teacher respondents. So thank you, special education teachers. Uh, for taking time out of your busy day as you again engage in synchronous and asynchronous learning uh, during this time of our COVID era that we are living in. Always wonderful to see general education teachers as we continue to try to partner together and work together in consultative practice, special educators, as well as general educators, EL specialists, district level and site level, special education administrators, thank you for all that you do as well, general education administrators, some SELPA friends, wonderful to always see SELPA friends and school psychologists, my, myself having been a school psychologist many moons ago and welcome speech therapists. So it's very nice to see such a diverse a group. And if I missed any titles, um, please feel free to drop them in the chat because we'd love to know who all our friends are who are joining us today for this session. So as we continue, I would encourage you, if you hear something you like today, a resource that you felt was of great value to you that you want to pay forward, feel free to go ahead, drop it in the chat and tweet. Tweet us, follow us become our friend uh, via social media so that we can continue to communicate and collaborate and engage in this collective co commitment that we have for supporting all English learners with disabilities. So please do tweet us. As recipients of the SELPA Content Lead Grant, we are absolutely honored to assist both the CDE and CCEE with dissemination of professional development and resources. We do work to support collaborative consultation and services to SELPAs, their respective LEAs and COEs, so that together we can continue to work and serve and ensure access and equity for all English learners and specifically for English learners with disabilities. That is our focus area in the Greater California System of Support. The California System of Support includes um, your county offices, of course, your LEAs. There are geographic leads, um, resource leads, but then we have our SELPA leads, and we have very distinct areas where we fit and support within the system. In Imperial County, we have been honored with the opportunity to engage in this work and support of English learners with disabilities. And we're on that far, far southeast corner of California, if you're not familiar with Imperial County. So I'll first introduce you to the California Practitioner's Guide for Educating English Learners with Disabilities. Today, during our two hour session, we will go through briskly all of the sections of the practitioner's guide in which there are five, beginning with identification of English learners and ending with reclassification from EL status. The California Practitioner's Guide was developed in partnership CDE EL division, who is now the multilingual division, alongside the special education division, where they too brought together their expertise and in collaboration. This foundational document is a free resource to be utilized by all who are willing to engage in this robust document. It provides us a foundation as it was written by many experts in the state of California in support again of English learners with disabilities to build a foundation so that we can all again bring our practices together, springboard from that knowledge and work together as a system collectively to improve outcomes for English learners with disabilities. Please note, however, that the information that I share with you today, as well as my colleagues, is based in the California Practitioner's Guide. It is a document to help us in engaging in best practices, ideas. We hope that you will engage in reflection, that you will find entry points that you can then take back to your districts, your school sites, your county offices, and or your SELPAs where you may see that change may need to occur, where you feel that perhaps your teams can hone your practices 
So you may find different entry points, different sections of the practitioner's guide that resonate with you and your work. So please know that all mandates, legal references are included in the practitioner's guide and you'll see many reference today during our presentation. Please, however, also know that you have your respective district policies, your EL master plans that again, you will refer to and when in doubt, please refer to your administrator, your district level policies and practices as well. So again, we hope to lead you on this journey through the California Practitioner's Guide. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lupita Olin Rubio for the next segment of our session. Hello everybody and thank you for joining us. I wanna give a special shout out to my uh, EL specialist friends out there. I wanna thank you and honor your participation today. And like Debbie said earlier, this is a collective commitment. And the title of this resource that we're going to give you a brisk walk through uh, is, is titled The Practitioner's Guide for Educating English Learners with Disabilities. So all practitioners, all folks involved in supporting the needs of all students, particularly English learners with disabilities, is important. So again, I want to thank all of you who uh, may not be in the special education world and who are here uh, with your special ed friends um, with this journey together to learn more about how can we best work together to support the needs of our, our, our kiddos. So with that said, um, I want to walk you through the first leg of uh, this walkthrough of the practitioner's guide, which is section one. As you can see here on the slide, our focus on, on section one involves topics related to students with disabilities who may be English learners. And then how do we determine their status? How do we identify their status? Another topic in this section involves uh, taking a look at the MTSS model and how it's designed to provide the appropriate and necessary supports for English learners as well as English learners with disabilities. So that's really the two key points in section one. So with that said, next slide please. Next slide please. Thank you. So let's take a look at who our English learners are. So our English learners with disabilities, who are they? By definition, our English learners are uh, students who have a limited English language proficiency and whose home or native language is any language other than English. And again, by definition, a student with disability is a student who has been formally identified as having a disability in one or more of the 13 uh, disability categories as indicated in uh, IDEA. Also, uh, whose disability adversely affects their learning such that special services are required um, and necessary. As we can see, about 28% of the student population is represented um, English learners with disabilities make up about 28% of the student population. Next slide. I'm having trouble seeing the screen. There it is. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. So it's important to note that students with IEPs are within each of these student subgroups. And each of these categories represents students who have unique needs and who are in need of specific supports to ensure full access, engagement, and academic success. This is important information for all schools and districts because it, it starts to paint a picture of what types of supports are necessary. It starts to help us think about what questions to ask, what parts of our system do we need to look at and revise. And the purpose of this practitioner's guide is to guide us through that process and to provide us with some tools and resources and, and hopefully enhance our practices and processes to address the very specific and unique needs, particularly of our students uh, who are English learners with disabilities. Next slide, please. And as a result of this information, districts and schools across the state are charged with the responsibility and the commitment to, ra to raise educational achieve achievement for students with disabilities and students with disabilities who are also English learners. Not an easy task. And this is why I wanted to give a special shout out to my EL specialist friends who are here joining us today. Because you know the, the cliche, it does take a village. It truly does. We need to unite our background, our expertise, our experiences, 
uh, so that we can provide the very best possible educational program and appropriate supports for English learners with disabilities. Next slide, please. So what does meeting the needs of English learners mean in California? If you've been around for a little bit, you know that it's been an ongoing campaign uh, for English learners and equitable education, starting from Lau versus Nichols and Castaneda and Picard, and most recently with the California Edge Initiative. All of these uh, movements and cases initiatives have helped transform education for English learners to ensure ad ad adequate instructional uh, procedures, meaningful opportunities to participate in public education, and creating welcoming and inclusive classrooms with culturally and linguistically diverse programs and, and um, services. Next slide. So in order to provide the appropriate supports, we need to be able to identify and know who our English learners are in our schools and, and districts. So let's become familiar with some of the tools and processes that help identify who our English learners are. So some of you may be familiar with this resource, the Home Language Survey. So the home language survey is designed to identify potential English learners. If a language other than English is identified on the home language survey, the student is assessed on the initial LPAC. The initial LPAC will identify the student performance level, whether it's novice, intermediate, or if the student is an initial fluent English proficient. The initial LPAC window just started very uh, starts July 1st and it goes throughout the school year, depending on when the student enters the, the school district. And it goes from July 1st through June 30th. And the parent or guardians are notified of the results in writing within the first 30 days or after the enrollment date. So the initial LPAC is the first tool that will help identify EL status and also give us some insight as to what proficiency level the student is in so that we can provide the appropriate uh, services and supports. Next slide. Once the student is classified as an English learner, he or she receives specialized linguistic and academic instructional services to support both English language development and academic progress. In other words, comprehensive ELD, right? Both designated ELD and integrated ELD. As required by state and federal law, the English learner is assessed in his or her language proficiency using the summative LPAC. The summative LPAC is yearly and is given to all students, all English identified English learners uh, up until the point of reclassification, which we will talk a little bit more about um, towards the end of our session in chapter nine. Next slide, please. Another key uh, topic in this section is referenced as an MTSS model and framework. So we think about and use the MTSS uh, model or framework as a way to determine um, quality instruction, the appropriate supports and interventions that are necessary before we uh, uh, move students towards the next phase, which in essence is a special education referral. So the MTSS model establishes an integrated and comprehensive framework focused on quality teaching and learning for all students in all content areas, which include comprehensive ELD. It's identified through three tiers of core instruction supports and interventions. And this is how they're described. So tier one is basically core instruction where universal support supports for all students are embedded. Evidence-based practices are basically the, the strategies that are used throughout core instruction. And they are in support of academics, behavioral and social, emo social emotional learning. Tier two focus, focuses on targeted and supplemental supports. And these are evidence-based practices for some students. And why I say some students is because after core instruction is in place and you still have some students that are still struggling who still need extra supports, um, we need to identify what specific skills um, based on assessments are those that need to be focused on and provided some more intensive uh, instruction and support on. So for these students in uh, tier two instruction, some additional supports are necessary as well as progress monitoring to ensure students are not falling further behind. Tier three instruction is targeted 
targeted and intensive supports and is designed for a few students. Individualized supports are based on assessments again and more frequent progress monitoring is necessary to ensure maxima, maximum acceleration and progress. So by design, the MTSS model exists to proactively provide for pre-referral process. We need to make sure that students are number one, provided with quality core instruction, which includes comprehensive ELD. After which, uh, when students are still falling behind, uh, we need to employ specific assessments to make sure that we are able to identify what specific skills are lacking and target those skills through instruction and best practices and progress monitoring and continue to provide the supports and exhaust all those supports and accommodations before we move forward towards special education referral. Next slide. A strong pre-referral process that guides teams to make an evidence-based decision prevents both under and over referral of English learners to special education programs. Here are some guiding questions that can assist teams in this process. Here are some key considerations to think about. Are we providing English learners enough time in the tier two or tier three before we make a decision to move to special education referral? Are we providing effective teaching methods specifically designed for English learners in your tier two interventions? And are they being provided by a quality instruction? Are progressing, progress monitoring methods and tools appropriate for English learners? And are they a language bias? So uh, there's a lot to be said about assessing in primary language to make sure that content and understanding is, uh, is there, is happening, and it's not an issue of, of a processing. And then finally, cultural and linguistically responsive practices, are they in place? Are we considering what uh, students are bringing to the table, what their assets are? You'll also notice off to the right side of this slide, a couple of figures that we wanna highlight to help you along uh, with this conversation, with this dialogue with your team. So figure 2.8 and 2.12 are in the practitioner's guide and you have easy access to them here as well as in the Padlet, I believe. Um, and they will assist teams in establishing a clear and common understanding of the three tiers of instruction that I briskly walked you through a little while ago, all designed to provide the appropriate supports for our students to ensure that we give them the quality instruction that they need with the appropriate services that, that are required as per their um, status, their EL status. Um, before we move them on to uh, the possibility of a pre-referral stage for special education. So that was my brisk walk of section one. I'm gonna hand it over back to Debbie to take us on our next leg of the practitioner's guide, which is section two. Thank you, Lupita. So as we reviewed section one and the importance of strong structures at the pre-referral level, of tier one, tier two, tier three, knowing that again, special education is beyond that tier three, special education existing outside of that system, how important it is to fully understand the needs of the students and that core level of instruction. So students who have been identified as having a disability who are also English learners, and those students who are English learners who perhaps do not require a referral, that they have received core, comprehensive, designated and integrated ELD is very important. If you find that your respective district still has questions about those tiers of intervention, please do refer to those figures of the practitioner's guide in chapter one and chapter two. So as we continue to move forward though, our review section two, which is pre-referral and referral assessment and the IEP process, walking you through chapters three, special education referrals for students who may be as students with disabilities and chapter four assessment of English learners. So as we seek to identify students appropriately, we look at what are your existing SST processes. So you may call them student success teams, student study teams. You refer to those district level site level teams whom refer students for further assessment. But what we'd hope is that this cycle, if you see here, that we'd have some ease into prior to referral, but rather that we look at referral practices, identification of concerns and strategies within those levels of supports, 
when we consider pre-referral activities and interventions, again, reevaluating what does designated ELD look like for the English learner and ensuring that students' language difference is not interpreted as a disability. So again, that item three here, if you see on this prong of the wheel, as we lead towards eligibility or potential referral, what is the data that your district has produced? What information is leading you to make the decision for referral? And should there be a referral for special education assessment that we consider cultural and linguistic practices? So as we move forward, I'll be discussing those prongs. So first and foremost, analyzing data, acknowledging in your district when we consider ELs, so first thinking as a student, as an English learner, where core is a foundation, have we analyzed the data and identified what does data-based intentional teaching look like? Are we culturally and linguistically responsive to the students' needs in bridging and understanding access? What are their needs for scaffolds and front loading? Analyzing intervention as far as fidelity to your respective ELD adopted programs within your district and differentiation of that instruction. And then after successive trials, do we need more supports? How is the student being supported in moving forward? At that time, then there may be a need for a referral for a child who may have other needs that may be associated with a disability. In California alone, what we've seen is that there's been an inordinate amount of students who have fallen into this category of specific learning disability. Students with disabilities, again, in the various disability categories are all very unique. So as we know, all of our English learners at very different um, frames and stages of their English language proficiency, and the same is true for students with disabilities, very different in their respective disability category, as each of us, all of us, with and without disabilities have relative strengths and relative weaknesses but wanted to touch a moment on specific learning disability as a category. When we consider students who may have a suspected specific learning disability, it's important for our multidisciplinary teams who sit on your SST teams, if you will, that they fully understand and have a common language of what is a specific learning disability as students may be referred as potentially having a specific learning disability as it is made up of two prongs and both prongs must exist in order to have a specific learning disability. So not only is it a discrepancy, patterns of strengths and weaknesses in any of these academic achievement areas, but that it's also directly linked to a severe discrepancy or pattern of strength and weakness in one of these processing disorder areas. So as you see here, there has to be a direct connection. So if we find that processing disorder alone or deficits in achievement alone, we need both. We need both to be able to firmly say this child does have a specific learning disability. And that's where it can become very challenged. We find that it's very hard to disentangle many times the language difference versus a potential disability. But what I can share with you is that a specific learning disability is not primarily due to limited school experience or poor school attendance, any social, cultural, economic disadvantages, and not an intellectual disability. That's a different disability category. So our students with a specific learning disability do not have cognitive dis difficulties or disabilities and cannot be students with limited English proficiency. So, if the child has a limited English proficiency, they may be referred and they may be a child with a disability. But if that is the true root cause for referral, teams would definitely have to rethink the referral process. So again, limited English proficiency in and of itself is not a reason for referral. If you are in a district, county office, SELPA, school site, and your teams are still having uh, conversations, is this a language acquisition issue or concern? Or is this possibly a learning disability? I would encourage you to engage in this jigsaw activity, again, because our time together is limited. We're not able to walk you through this activity today. 
but this is a resource that you can reuse and reflect upon with your respective teams in your district. You'll see the Jigsaw activity linked here, and it's also found in your Padlet. This is an excellent resource. Um, I do have to give credit to Dr. Jerry Sweaterfield, an expert in our field, who helped and assisted creating this grid, which is a comparison of language differences versus disabilities. This figure can be found in the California Practitioner's Guide, and we have uh, extracted it, if you will, for your use at a later time. So it is linked into this presentation as well as the Padlet, because we acknowledge that there are many conversations about could it be language acquisition or could it be potentially a disability? And we know that it is difficult when, again, our students are struggling perhaps in both prongs, having needs associated with both. And why the importance of the pre-referral activities? Very important, again, coming back to your SST teams and your MTSS structures, what are our systems entail? So should you be in a situation where you're moving towards potential referral, this is some guidance that might help your teams moving forward. First and foremost, a multidisciplinary student study success team is very important that we have both general educators, special educators, EL specialists coming together and sharing in their expertise and a collaborative commitment to ensuring that we are having fruitful conversations, intentional practices about students who are English learners prior to referral. And considering again, who all needs to be on that team. As you continue through your journey, this resource may be a supportive tool. And although these resources I have to share were created pre-pandemic, pre-COVID era, they are definitely applicable as a resource, as a document to ground your teams and support your teams as you go through these stages of pre-referral, so both now and into the future. So a deep and thorough cumulative file check is very important so that you're able to identify the various needs of the student, progress, have there been moves during um, their period in education, have their education been all in the U.S., um, potentially not. What information do you have to gather and glean on as you move through this process, considering all prongs and all needs of the child? As we also move forward, having a keen understanding of any extrinsic factors that are impacting or affecting our students. Although pre-pandemic, we were able to sit around a table and engage with families and caregivers, legal guardians, and have active conversations regarding the needs of our students, we also acknowledge that it has become that much more difficult. So this tool, again, this is a different appendix, Appendix 3.3, might be a tool that you might lean into as a team to help ground you in having active conversations and interviews with parents and guardians regarding any potential impacts that the student is having, maybe inside education and outside. Especially right now during COVID-19, we know that many parents are suffering. We know that our students and our families are engaging with potential loss of loved ones, basic needs that are still needing to be fulfilled, and where our education system can come around and potentially assist with referrals. And consider whole child thinking as we look at both the cultural, linguistic, and supportive needs of our students. So this resource may be a supportive tool to you also as you continue to investigate and support students in considering all factors, not only them as an English learner, but other basic needs that may be necessary. Again, a, definitely a resource that we would lead you to can be found in the Padlet as well. So as you've considered, again, pre-referral, the reasons for referral, that deep CUME file review, acknowledging any extrinsic factors that may be also impacting education, learning and progress, considering what the interventions have been. Have there been um, additions to interventions? What supportive tools and practices? And we'll speak to accessibility a little bit later in this presentation as well as accessibility tools. I also have in this presentation, just some logos that might support you if you're having questions regarding basic EL roadmap principles. How are we assisting students and acknowledging all of the practices that we can support building upon their primary language? How can we assist and support with those scaffolds and acknowledging what they bring and all the beauty that multicultural and language difference brings with it into our education system? So if one of the questions you're having is still, what does integrated and designated ELD look like for our students? 
this might be a help, these might be helpful resources to you as well and can be found on our Padlet because that is a fundamental question. As we know that ELD standards and integrated support is across content areas. Our English learners are English learners where they're participating in math, in English, in history, in science, but that they also have protected time through designated ELD to support and reinforce their learning and proficiency in English. And again, language difference versus disability. This pre-referral checklist is also a useful tool. So if you're finding that your teams are having conversations about what are our processes? And again, it may be written and unwritten practices that you're reflecting upon right now. This might be a tool to help your teams as far as English learner initial referral and decision-making processes. This decision-making tree is a very helpful resource. It's actually also uh, extracted from another resource and thank you to San Diego Unified who worked on this resource again in support of identifying when teams may find it appropriate to refer or potentially to not refer to special education and to continue to provide interventions. This tool again might be a resource for your teams. And then we look at assessment. So should your teams find that yes, assessment is necessary, that given that the child has received integrated and designated ELD, core instructional foundation already, that they've been supported in their practices and a referral for special education is still needed as there are additional wonderings and questions about the child's progress and learning. Please note that during COVID-19, we are still held to the same threshold regarding assessments, referrals, and all timelines associated with special education assessments. There have been no changes, waivers uh, to our respective uh, responsibilities and mandates. Please also know that in as much as special education mandates have not changed because they are federal mandates, um, our English language learner mandates have not changed either as federal mandates. So again, our responsibilities continue during this COVID era that we're experiencing. For more information regarding special education assessments, these are active links in the presentation slides, which will also be added to our Padlet. So from CDE, uh, California Department of Education, they have been very clear again, that assessments must continue during distance learning. Um, the U.S. Department of Education has not waived any of our responsibilities when we consider infant to preschool, preschool to kinder, and all school-aged assessments for special education, including annual IEPs, triannual, and initial evaluations. So just as a footnote, I would be remiss to say, because I know how challenging this has become for many of our practitioners in the field, that although there is guidance um, regarding assessments, CDE does not expressively prohibit in-person assessments. So districts at this point in time may be conducting in-person assessments, virtual assessments, uh, all again with safety and PPE in place. We want to ensure the safety of our students, our staff and their respective families. So again, given all of the safety parameters, there may be in-person assessments occurring as well as virtual assessments and combinations thereof. I have added links and resources into this presentation should you want to know more about assessments. Um, because as a component or structural feature of special education, and specifically regarding students who are English learners, I think our biggest worry is at any given time, pre-COVID, during COVID, and I'm sure after, is the possibility of over-identification of English learners as students with disabilities or misidentification of English learners as students with disabilities. Chapter four contains much information regarding assessments. Again, if you are an assessor or work with assessors, I would definitely recommend this particular chapter because part of that again is rem remembering that our responsibility comes back to assessing, assessing in primary language in our students' native language where appropriate and feasible to ensure that our assessments are valid, reliable, and comprehensive, even now during the COVID pandemic, ensuring that our assessments are non-discriminatory, that we ensure we assess for the right things, that we're assessing using tools and instruments that ensure that we are assessing for aptitude and skill, uh, not lack of English language or proficiency, that we do not delay uh, assessments for outside diagnoses or because of the pandemic, that we're mindful of our responsibilities to ensure that we are providing students with the supports and that they need. As assessors, 
whether you're a special education teacher assessing, a general education teacher, school psychologist, speech therapist, occupational therapist, APE specialist, and we know our responsibilities in relation to the types of assessments that are needed. However, being keen and sensitive to linguistic and cultural biases, explicit, implicit, that we're acknowledging that again, there may be more information that we need to gather. This uh, English language, uh, language use of the student is a very uh, extensive resource to help you and craft and build rapport with the students whom you're assessing to identify what is their comfort in their L1? Where are they feeling themselves as far as their proficiency in English and both? So again, another useful resource for you as you gather information. These particular gathering observational data informational tools can be utilized pre-referral, during referral, after referral, and we hope that you use them as well. Because if you're having wonderings again, what does learning look like pre-COVID and even now? And it may be that assessments definitely look different now uh, because there may be combinations thereof and observations potentially are occurring as you're zooming in or your Google Classroom or however it is that you're conducting synchronous and asynchronous learning. Though these checklists were developed pre-COVID, they may be resourceful tools for you as well as you um, observe both in general education settings and ELD settings in um, social constructs as students are engaged in conversations, whether in breakout rooms or Zoom sessions, and involving the parents. Very importantly, again, involving the parents and getting a good understanding of how parents are feeling, the supportive structures that potentially they need to further support their children as well. So again, we refer you to these resources that may be supportive tools for you, and they can also be found on the Padlet and on our website. So now, should you refer a student who is an English learner for assessment, the assessment plan is the responsibility of our, of our respective districts and assessors. The assessment plan, and I show you a sample here of SACE because I have to have, add a disclaimer that in our respective SELPA, we do use SACE as our information system. You may be in a different SELPA who utilizes potentially SERAS, WellAgent, or a different special education system. But I can share you the example because the language is true for all state adopted forms across California, is that there has always been the disclaimer in the assessment plan, which indicates that there may be, but not limited to classroom observations, rating skills, interviews, record reviews, one-to-one -one testing, and other types of combinations of tests. So in your districts, if you are having concerns about what assessments look like, do know that we have always had the opportunity to vary the modality given the needs of the student, the needs of the staff, and ensuring valid, accessible, comprehensive assessments. So we do have some ability there to ensure that we have opportunities to gather the information that we need. Of course, knowing our responsibilities to provide a parent written notice so that parents are understanding of the type of assessment and the assessment tools to be utilized and or parents right potentially to refuse an assessment. Uh, if you are an assessor and you have questions regarding the various uh, accessibility tools, bilingual assessment tools and inventory lists, for assessing students of various languages, because I would be remiss to admit, many districts have multiple languages in your respective counties, um, and maybe even different dialects within languages, and you're searching for a bilingual assessment tools. It's not an exhaustive list, but please know it's a resource that's available to you through the California Practitioner's Guide as well. Also know that linked in today's Padlet, you have an additional Padlet that's available to you, which is the assessments of ELs for special education eligibility. Uh, the resource that I discussed earlier regarding language difference versus disability is also linked into that Padlet and is a free resource for you. Again, as assessors, if you have questions regarding assessments and accessibility. So please know that that's available to you also as an additional uh, resource or gathering of resources. I'm going to head into section three now, which is part of the practitioner's guide in relation to educational programs, instructional strategies. Chapter five, developing the IEP for English learners specifically. So we won't discuss the full development of the IEP, but those elements that are unique for English learners in that IEP process, as well as educational programming, equity and access for English learners with disabilities, as well as teaching and learning to meet the student's needs. 
Before I head into section three, though, I do recognize that we've been almost with each other for an hour. So let's take a quick pause for a 10 minute break. So if we could return at 155, and it'll also give us as panelists some time to also look into the chat. I know, thank you, Vanessa. She's been moderating the chat and dropping links for you there. We'll take some time to review some of the items in the chat while you take a 10 minute break. We'll circle back at 155. Thank you. So we'll be sure to take a quick minute to review the Padlet possibly before we end today's session. I see questions of you know, how do I find the resources? And yes, today's recording will be posted on our website as well as the CEC website. Um, Vanessa, if you don't mind, in the chat, put the um, website to the training modules that are found on our website. So I think some of the questions might also, um, we have other videos for each section that um, you may want to watch. Uh, Mr. Sanchez, regarding uh, sharing uh, with your graduate students, absolutely, by all means, please do share, share, share.
Thank you, Vanessa, for dropping that in the chat. Thank you for your question. We do um, also, and no plug intended or advertisement, uh, but we do also um, have strong feelings. I would say um, that if everyone could at least, um, if all assessors had knowledge of the CLIM or access to it, it is a very resourceful tool. Uh, Dr. Samuel Ortiz, again, great information that he has shared with the field regarding English learners with disabilities. I would absolutely uh, recommend it. We also have a video, uh, Jenny Ponzerik, uh, is also a good friend of our teams and she did provide us and we have it recorded on our website in the training modules. So if you do have anyone who's interested in the same CLIM or wants just a quick intro to the CLIM, please do access our website. Uh, Vanessa added the link a little bit earlier where we do have a recorded training module on the CLIM and its use as a supportive tool. Again, because it is difficult, uh, assessors, again, with so much on their plate and trying to disaggregate the data that's available to them. And the CLIM many times helping assessors identify, is there something missing? Have I maybe overlooked a certain area? Perhaps more subtests are necessary to ensure, again, that we are comprehensive, valid, um, in our assessments, their assessments are reliable and appropriate for our students who are English learners. And that's the culture, Cultural Language Interpretive Matrix, CLIM. And again, there is a pre-recorded uh, video on our website, as well as all of the resources that correspond to that video. So there's a folder for every video on our website. There is a folder with resources that anyone can access and reuse as you see appropriate. Thanks, Vanessa. So we have about two minutes. So participants, if you'd like to get a quick drink of water, um, grab that last cup of coffee and we'll go ahead and keep on going. We know that your time is precious and valuable. Um, as you engage with us during this session. And we'll move forward with discussing the IEP. Okay, we're about to get started. So again, one minute till, and we'll proceed with our presentation. <clears throat> Okay, 
So we'll continue with chapter five of the California Practitioner's Guide. Again, remember that today's presentation is a introduction. So truly an introduction to the California Practitioner's Guide. Should you want more information or resources, feel free to reach out to us at Imperial County Office of Education, Imperial County SELPA. You do have our, our information and we will add these presentation slides. Please do follow the chat box and please feel free to enter your questions in the chat. We are hoping to get through our session and answer some of your questions as well. And I believe we will answer some of your questions as we go through. So um, there were some questions regarding alternate LPAC. Please know that we will get to that in the next segment today as we talk about accessibility, the LPAC and the alternate LPAC uh, for students with significant cognitive disabilities. The information that I shared uh, earlier uh, regarding chapters three through four, do know it is applicable to pre-K. Um, again, there should be some form of mechanism in which your districts then refer students as part of IDEA. Our responsibilities extend beyond school age, so we do serve infants all the way to age 22. Uh, so again, the referral processes may look a little bit different for preschoolers, but do know preschoolers may be referred for special education as well and have an IEP. So I'll proceed with chapter five, developing an IEP for English learners with disabilities. So there are some basic assumptions as we go into this chapter. Should a student be referred for special education and in fact be found as eligible for special education? The IEP uh, does have successive responsibilities in discussing the needs of English learners, because as we know, we think of whole child thinking. So an English learner with a disability needs different layers of support when we think about both the comprehensive ELD and interventions, integrated ELD, as well as special education supports as related to their respective disability category. Again, no one student is the same. So as we develop the IEP for English learners, key questions that the IEP team will need to discuss, consider, and come upon agreements in, to ensure supports for students with disabilities is three key decisions. And these specifically are in ed code and fall under the jurisdiction of the IEP team. The language of instruction, and if there's a need for primary language supports, use of accessibility tools, or the use of an alternate assessment for the LPAC or CASP, and how and where ELD instruction will be provided in the general education setting or the special education setting. And if instruction will be provided by a general education teacher, special education teacher, or through designated ELD, a combination of maybe it's a push in or a pull out support. But these need to be discussed. So as we move forward, we will tap upon these three items again language of instruction, accessibility tools, and how and where ELD designated instruction will be provided. Six main principles of IDEIA, which are responsibilities for students with disabilities of free and appropriate public education. Of course, comprehensive and valid evaluation, development of the IEP, which includes not only parent and student participation, but their meaningful parent and student participation, that parents are fully informed, least restrictive environment and procedural safeguards that we ensure the rights of all students, and utmost access and educational benefit. That is our goal for our students, that curriculum and instruction is accessible and equitable to ensure educational benefit and progress of our students. So who makes up the IEP team? So when we consider again, I have to say I do default to samples from the SACE program. We do utilize SACE and I apologize if you're in another county that doesn't utilize SACE. That is our frame of reference, but I do have the ed code and federal codes listed there for your reference. But when we think about IEP participants, but not limited to again, the parents, guardians, special education teachers, but I want to specifically and uniquely highlight here, EL coaches, EL specialists, whatever their title might be, EL coordinators at your site, because as we have conversations regarding special education and English learners with disabilities and what education will look like for our students who are English learners, that we have the needed expertise of that English language learner specialist on our team to help us to further consider again, what are the options available in the core as well as special education interventions and supports. So it's very important that we have that as our multidisciplinary team. So as you see this example here, who's missing 
that EL specialist. So that empty line there is for our EL specialist. Very important and often forgotten. So please do consider again, who is your EL specialist? Who can you go to as a special educator? And the same is true for your EL specialist. Who is that special educator, lead person, or special director whom you need to then be best friends with moving forward? Because we encourage, again, that partnership between special education and general education because our English learners with disabilities, they need us. They need our partnership, our collaboration together so that we can continue to support and assist effectively and intentionally our English learners with disabilities. So as I mentioned, ensuring active and meaningful participation. And though pre-COVID, yes, we had this beauty of engaging with our families and connecting with them uh, uniquely. Now it is maybe via Teams, via Google Meets, via Zoom, whatever the platform is that your respective district is utilizing. Again, ensuring they receive meaningful information, maybe translated if necessary. Always remembering that if parents need information translated, that we have that accessible to them and a translator during the session as well, so that again, they can meaningfully engage in the information that we're about to impart regarding their child who has been identified as a student with a disability. The parent report form is also a very useful tool pre assessment, during assessment, during SST, and as you build your IEPs. Parent information, again, very foundational as we want to ensure that we fully understand students' interests, strengths, not only from our eyes, but the eyes of their home. So this informational tool might be a supportive tool for you as you conduct an, as any assessment, observations, and of course, if you are developing an IEP. Assessments, data count, the collection and presentation of asset-based skills. And we do truly want to lead you back to the California English Language Learner Roadmap. If you're not familiar with the roadmap and the principles, we highly encourage because as we again want to build common language between our special educators and our general educators for this very reason, so that we have common language and understanding regarding what our students' present levels of performance is. As an English learner, where the students' entry points, skills, and abilities are as they learn English, as they build their proficiency, and then also acknowledging and understanding that they have their own beautiful and unique language in their L1. How do we build upon so that we ensure that the scaffolds, the supports, our front loading, our accommodations are acknowledging both their needs as an English learner and as a student with a disability? Our LPAC score reports might look a little bit different. Um, we may have some challenges right now, as I know many of you, because the window has opened, are assessing in person your English learners. So again, the more we know about our students' existing English language proficiency level and how they are engaging in academic English is very important, that we include that in our present levels of performance as yet another part of understanding the baseline skills, both strengths interests and weaknesses of our students in the IEP. Predominantly, we want to focus on in every IEP though is our students' strengths. Where are they now? What can they do? How can we take those attributes and build upon them? In our IEPs, I would be um, naive to say that all IEPs are positive and how do we get there? Very important reflective questions that our IEP teams need to discuss about how do we ensure that we're telling our students story and how they have bring so much to the table about seeing our students as multi-abled rather than the focus on their disability in and of itself, but where we can assist them and build upon that skill and help them to continue to enjoy and progress in their educational journey. So in the present levels of performance, it does take a look at communication and not just communication because I know my speech therapists love this section and we always say this is the section for our speech therapist but yet how do we also acknowledge our students communication in English what is their progress what is their development again um, as educators assessors special education and general education that we have a general understanding regarding the various levels based on their LPAC proficiency. This is yet only one assessment and a snapshot, but it does help us come around and have active conversations of where students are now and where they are in relation to those ELD standards. And how, again, what does their protected time for ELD look like based on this information? How do we then layer on supports for special education? 
The present levels of performance page um, has ed benefit reminders that we wanted to share with you. And though we can't go deeply into them, we wanted to share these with you so that again, you can have fruitful conversations about the whys and knowing that our present levels of performance leads into the development of goals and objectives and truly knowing where our students are now. Where does our data tell us about our students? Gathering again, more observational data. Observational data is important to our students. And although again, we are in the pandemic, um, English learners are in the classroom, are being provided with instruction, and we want to ensure accessibility, equity and access for our students. So having a keen eye in those observations is important. So as a general educator and a special educator, are you able to come together and have observations and conversations that are unique and intentional about how this will shape practice? So again, these are resources that are in your Padlet and they may assist you on this journey of what observations look like even pre-COVID. And I also have to share that as our students continue and we're almost a year now in distance learning and some of you may be in in-person instruction or small in-person cohorts or 100% distance learning. I would highly encourage IEP teams to not only discuss observations and input with existing year teachers, so this year's teacher, but also last year's teacher and service providers because there may have been changes in our students and their skills and abilities and how they feel social emotionally, their mental health and their just general ability and engagement. So wherever possible, as you develop IEPs during the course of this school year, that you also, where appropriate and where available, contact last year's teacher, the pre-COVID teacher, if you will, and have active conversations of what did learning look like for that child and how was student engaging and progressing in learning prior to pandemic and then of course, during distance learning now. So now, as we look at accessibility supports and statewide assessments, I'm going to turn it over to Vanessa Lopez, who will continue with the conversation. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So in looking at the special factors page, next slide, please. There is a need for individualized consideration of certain factors in the IEP development and revision. And those factors are largely behavior, English proficiency, blindness or visual impairment, communication needs, deafness, and assistive technology. So these educational benefit reminders range from AT, how do we move from low tech, no tech, high tech tools, and those considerations for low incident services and or equipment. Specifically for English learners, we are considering whether English learners with disabilities are provided with instructional systems and supports which meet their ELD needs and disability needs and how and where will ELD develop or ELD be provided. Also, it is on the special factors page again, um, reminding you that this is a snapshot of a SACE page. Um, if there are any behaviors that impede learning, describe how that behavior impedes the learning and what positive behavior interventions and supports are necessary for the student. All of this information again supports the development of um, the special factors page that is specific to the needs of the individual. Next slide, please. As we look at addressing assistive technology needs for our students and increasing access of our students through the use of assistive technology, we know that IDEA mandates that special education students must be provided AT devices and or services, a related service or as a supplementary aid. Basically AT means any item, piece of equipment, product or product system, whether required commercially or off the shelf, that is modified, customized, or used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of a child with a disability. So if we take a look at some of the screenshots that we have listed on this slide, we know that some of these resources are resources that are currently being used as we engage in distance learning, whether it be different uh, platforms that we're using for students, the uh, turning on of certain resources included within Google Apps uh, for Education, translation, speech to text, text to speech, the use of AAC devices for students with more complex needs and accessing resources to support the individualized needs of students, specifically in our case, English learners with disabilities. Next slide, please. Because again, if we keep in mind when the student is an English learner, we have to identify does the student need primary language support and what would that look like? 
where will ELD services be provided to the student and whether the student will participate in a specific type of program. Additionally, you would want to document in this section what that communication looks like, what those services look like, the location and the level of the student, the English language profici proficiency, the ELP of the individual student. Next slide, please. Because we know that as part of their education, their core education, all English learners must have access to comprehensive ELD. And comprehensive ELD is a comprehensive approach to the English language development frameworks as it states that English learners at all proficiency levels and at all ages require both integrated and designated ELD. Integrated ELD being the ELD that is working in tandem with content standards and provides access for the content being covered and designated ELD being that protected period of time devoted specifically to English language development standards. Next slide, please. Because this in turn will inform how it is that we provide supports for students for statewide assessments. Again, if we are considering the level of instruction, the type of instruction, the where, the who, and the how of comprehensive ELD, it will help us really meet the needs of the individual students as we're talking about the intersection of English language proficiency and disability. It is important to keep these two in mind as we are completing the statewide assessment page and addressing how the student will participate in the CASP, including the LPAC, initial and summative, as well as identifying if the student will be assessed using an alternate assessment. The accessibility resources that are listed in the statewide assessment page that are open for discussion for the IEP team include UDAs, U for universal tools, D for designated supports, and A for accommodations. These may be included as an embedded support or a non-embedded support. It is here where these will be documented. Next slide, please. Some additional considerations that the IEP team may have upon completing the statewide assessments page or having the discussion for English learners with disabilities is what accessibility resources have been applied to the SBAC, the LPAC, depending on the domain. Because again, we know we have the four domains when considering the LPAC. Additionally, how do these accessibility resources support the students' identified needs? Going back to that present levels page, the area of need, how do these relate? And how are these accessibility resource supports provided during instructions? Is this something that the student having access to during instruction so that when assessment time comes, they are able to access and utilize as they are demonstrating mastery and or growth? And over the years, were there any needed adjustments made to the accessibility resources? How is this discussed? How is this structured? How is student feedback taken into account? Has the student mentioned that, yes, this is a resource that is supportive, or is this a resource that is distracting to me? And where appropriate, where domain exemptions appropriate for the student when we consider the LPAC? Is the manifestation of the disability really not allowing the student to access certain domains of the LPAC. And if so, it is exactly here where these deep discussions need to be held and documented for the IEP. Next slide, please. To help guide these discussions, we have two forms available here. And again, these are included in the Padlet. And this is the LPAC Administration Student Accessibility Checklist. And what it really does, it is way more than a checklist. It really supports and guides the IEP team discussion and really taking a look at the LPAC by domain. Listening, speaking, reading, writing. Are universal tools appropriate? Are designated supports appropriate? Are accommodations appropriate? Are there unlisted resources that may be appropriate for the individual student? Again, not just in one domain, but in all fours, having that deep discussion, considering the manifestation of the disability and the student's current English language proficiency. If appropriate, is a domain exemption something that could be discussed? Is this something that the student would benefit from? And if we have a domain exemption, where would it be? Keeping in mind, of course, that it can't be two, like in listening, speaking, and oral language, it would have to be one. 
and in reading, writing, it would have to be only one for written expression. Again, considering also if an alternate assessment is appropriate. And if the team does determine that an alternate assessment may be up in discussion, using the alternate assessment decision confirmation worksheet as a way to really confirm whether this is appropriate for a student. In delving deeper into accessibility resources, we have a variety of documents that are accessible in the Padlet as well as on the CDE website. To start off, we have a guide to help you walk through the effective use of accessibility resources. And then the really the anchoring document, which is a California Assessment Accessibility Resources Matrix. This takes place of Matrix 1 and Matrix 4, Matrix 1 being the one developed earlier for CASP and Matrix 4 for LPAC. Now we've taken those two matrices, not us, CDE has taken those matrix, the matrices and have developed the one matrix for you to have access. And here you are really able to not just go into a bird's eye view of some of the UDAs available for the student, whether they are taking the computer base or the paper pencil, but also help you look at where they are accessible as it pertains to each domain. So always making sure that when you're having this discussion, you have these documents accessible so that you're able to determine if this truly is an appropriate resource for the student as they engage in statewide assessments. Next slide, please. Because we know that the LPAC and the alternate LPAC are definitely an area of focus when we're talking about students who are dually identified. We also need to keep in mind that if a student has a significant cognitive disability and an IEP, and if the IEP team confirms that a review of the student's records and IEP indicates a disability or multiple disabilities that significantly impact intellectual functioning and adaptive behavior, then the alternate LPAC may be appropriate for the student. Again, this with the support of the uh, alternate LPAC decision confirmation worksheet will really support the guiding of the discussion in determining if this is appropriate for students. However, next slide please, I'd be remiss not to point out that for 2021, the alternate LPAC has been postponed until 2021-2022 school year. You may find additional information regarding this on the link provided on the slide. Next slide please. Blueprints for English Language Development Connectors are um, included also here on this page. The ELD connectors represent the highest level of expected performance in English language proficiency for English learners with the most significant cognitive disabilities at any given grade or grade span. The, the connectors are not intended to represent the full range of performance in English language proficiency that may, be, that may be measured by a standardized alternate ELP, English language proficiency assessment. Rather, it's a rigorous standard setting process that is applied to actual assessment results. And these will identify performance levels at various cut points. The performance levels are supported um, and you can use this as a guiding document. Again, there is a link included in this slide for you to access and explore further. Next slide, please. So now given that the alternate LPAC will not be available for this current school year, um, it may be that you are using a locally determined alternate assessment. Now, in our case, the case of our SELPA, the alternate, the locally determined alternate assessment is the VCALPS. However, please refer to your LEA's reclassification procedures as reviewed by the DLAC and your EL master plan to um, find out what your locally determined alternate English language proficiency assessment is. You may find additional information on the links provided on the slides. Next slide, please. Because this in turn, all of that to say that it is important to determine the, the English language proficiency level of each of our individual students so that we may develop linguistically appropriate goals and objectives. When drafting IEP goals, the IEP team should consider the cognitive level of the student, the linguistic level of the student, the developmental level of the student's primary language and second language, as well as overall performance in designated and integrated ELD instruction, aka comprehensive ELD, as well as access to the student's prior knowledge and experiences and inclusion of culturally relevant materials and experiences, as well as the student's heritage. All of, the, all of these need to come together as we develop linguistically appropriate goals and objectives. 
Next slide, please. The California Practitioner's Guide for Educating English Learners indicates that linguistically appropriate goals are not specific ELD goals, but rather are goals that align with the ELD standards to support the student in language acquisition and ultimately in meeting their academic goals, as well as accessing and making progress in the grade level curriculum. Next slide, please. One of the tools that you can use in helping you develop these linguistically appropriate goals and objectives is having access to all of these resources at hand. One of the ways that you can do that is through the California Content Standards mobile app. It provides quick targeted access to the content standards. So using the app to search, filter, and sort standards to isolate specific content is helpful as you work through using the information contained in your special factors page, in your present levels page, to really develop a goal that supports those identified areas of need, as well as the student's individual English language proficiency results. Next slide, please. And also in making sure that we've covered all of these important areas, there is a great resource included in the California Practitioner's Guide. This is Appendix 5.1, which is the IEP team checklist for English learners. You'll find that this appendix is accessible by clicking on the document included on this slide, and also by visiting the Padlet and accessing the California Practitioner's Guide, as well as accessing one of the links that were dropped in the chat box. So this checklist really supports the IEP team in making determinations that we've included the appropriate information to help meet the needs of students who are dually identified. Next slide, please. Because this will be important as we address educational programming, access and equity for English learners with disabilities. And Lupita will take it over from here. Thanks, Vanessa. So Vanessa walked us through uh, things to consider, tools and processes to take into consideration when we are talking about providing appropriate supports uh, to English learners, English learners with disabilities or duly identified students. So the next two chapters um, involve exactly that, how considerations, tools, talking points uh, for individuals and for teams to really think about uh, your educational programming for your English learners with disabilities, how and how and to what degree are we providing access and equity? And then also what are some teaching and learning um, strategies and techniques uh, to employ in order to be able to do that. So with that, with those two key ideas in mind, next slide please, what comes to mind is we can't talk about access and equity without talking about the least restrictive environment. Next slide, please. This slide offers us a continuum of supports and services as described by the IEP educational setting page uh, to give us a clear picture of the least restrictive environment. So you'll see here in, in the range from least restrictive to most restrictive. And thinking about the term IEP where the I individual is really the focus and where import, how important it is to have as much information and data as possible on the student, um, from the student, from all the practitioners who are in contact with the student, the parents, caregivers, all of this information is absolutely critical in order to determine and, and make the decision about placement in the most appropriate, least restrictive environment. Next slide, please. So we're talking about dually identified um, students, English learners who are also English learners with a disability or disabilities. It's important to recognize that the least restrictive environment isn't a place. It's a principle. It guides the educational program for students with disabilities. Special education law uh, indicates that students with disabilities should be learning along their general ed peers to provide to the maximum extent possible access to the content and, and equity as well. This includes access to core curriculum, which stated earlier includes comprehensive ELD, designated and integrated ELD in the most least restrictive environment. So this is where we start thinking about where and asking ourselves a question, where is the student, where is the duly identified student receiving comprehensive ELD, specifically designated ELD, in which the student is 
um, learning through um, intentional and deliberate instruction of English language, the language of English so that they can not only learn English and further develop their proficiency, but also access the content through integrated ELD. Next slide, please. We have uh, provided you here as well as in the Padlet links to resources in our website uh, to give you um, so an idea, right? Some resources, some tools to get us thinking about how do we provide teaching and learning support for English learners with disabilities uh, without digging in much deeper into both chapters six and seven. We want to be able to connect you to the tools and resources right away. And that's what you're going to find here. And lastly, next slide, please. We, I want to leave you with this thought that an English learner carries a dual responsibility just as much as we have a dual responsibility to provide access and equity through comprehensive ELD in the most least restricted environment. They are learning a new language while simultaneously learning the content in English. This is why it's really important for us to be able to identify what assets, what students are able to do, and then use the appropriate assessments and processes to identify what are uh, the gaps, what are the disabilities, and then connect the dots, if you will, make the connection with the appropriate resources, the appropriate supports, the appropriate tools, the appropriate services, so that we can then move the student along whether it's along the tier one type of instruction, tier two, tier three, and or finally, after we exhaust all of those supports, uh, the pre-referral stage into special education programming. So on that, I'm gonna hand it back to my friend, Debbie, who's gonna walk us through the final leg of this um, walkthrough of the California Practitioner's Guide. Deb? Thank you. Thank you so well said, Lupita, as we consider our students who are duly identified. So students who in fact are English learners and have a disability, we would say it's perhaps also thrice the load. So not only as an English learner, learning new content and also the associated attributes to their respective disabilities and what challenges it is that they carry amongst all content areas. So again, as we think of the uniqueness of our students, we also acknowledge that there are potentially students across California who have been misidentified as students who are English learners. So when perhaps the IEP team is proposing an exit from special education services. Again, EL services, separate core foundation and special education services that are layered on top as based on the student's unique disability. So if in fact there are situations amongst your respective districts, county offices or SELPAs where you're finding that students may have been misidentified as a student with a disability. So yes, the child's an English learner. However, we need to potentially consider an exit from special education status. The process is quite complicated. We know that there are many liabilities, mandates, federal and state mandates that we need to uphold and to be truly sure about the assessments so as discussed earlier, again, that the assessments are valid and reliable and comprehensive, that there was use of assessments in the child's primary language were necessary, translators were necessary, and also acknowledgement again for where the student is at that moment in time that the assessment is fully comprehensive and valid and ensuring that that is the right decision. This here is just a sample that we provided to you with reflective questions that the team may want to ponder and acknowledge, should you be considering the exit from special education? So again, multidisciplinary team necessary, both from the EL and special education sides to discuss with their expertise and the lens and all of the information that they have regarding the student and possibly wanting to gather additional information before making such an important decision. Should the IEP team determine that an exit is necessary, potential considerations for 504 plan development. Also acknowledging what are the supports that the student will need to continue to be successful should they be exited from special education. And then separately, is this also a reclassification issue? So there are many layers that would need to be discussed in every IEP team, again, within the IEP team to discuss is there a potential need and exit for from special education? Very difficult scenarios, very unique 
case by case scenarios. There are some scenarios um, that could be reviewed by your teams in the California Practitioner's Guide if there are students who potentially you feel maybe were misidentification occurred and over identification where the student in fact is an English learner and needs English language learner supports or more robust supports to develop English language, but yet uh, does not have a disability, there is a process that the IEP team could take to again, determine if there was a misidentification, this scenario might assist and help you through that process. Separate and apart for that though, we may also have students who need to be reclassified from English learner status. So a child who has been receiving successive supports, so they receive supports as an English learner and there are a student with a disability, they can be reclassified as all English learners can be reclassified. However, many considerations need to take place prior to. So as you consider the potential pathway towards reclassification, knowing that English language proficiency assessment is the first criterion in this pathway, followed by teacher evaluation, parent involvement, and student performance. What is static across California is that an overall performance level of four is required for consideration for meeting criterion one. Although criteriums two, three, and four are locally determined for reclassification, we begin at level one to identify as discussed earlier, as Vanessa presented, there are various accessibility tools and perhaps based on the disability of the student and the uniqueness of that disability, perhaps accommodations are necessary and or domain exemptions. And of course, for students with significant cognitive disabilities, they can be reclassified if they have a significant cognitive disability and take an alternate assessment. Again, right now during COVID, taking the um, locally determined alternate assessment. And within reclassification for students with disabilities, specifically, we have three pathways. The first pathway is an English learner with disabilities who are able to demonstrate English language proficiency in all four domains, listening, speaking, reading, and writing, with or without accommodations. Again, important that we acknowledge accessibility tools and that they're available for our students when they assess with the LPAC. Pathway two, for our English learners with significant cognitive impairments, who are assessed using an alternate English language proficiency assessment process. So again, clearly once we have uniformity across the state with the alternate LPAC, which should be forthcoming in 2021, at this time your locally determined alternate may be useful to you in this process should you be considering um, reclassification. Please know also that when we're looking at alternate assessment, if you um, would like more information on reclassification with use of the VCALPS, the, at least that's our locally determined alternate, we do have a video on our website that you can watch um, and utilize those resources as well. And then lastly, the third prong, pathway three, English learners with disabilities whose disability precludes assessment in one or more domains. So as we briefly touched upon, if you are using that LPAC accessibility tool and checklist to guide conversations in your IEP team meetings, you may find that a domain exemption is necessary. Or where a student having given accommodations, exhausting all resources, and then perhaps a domain exemption because of the uniqueness of that disability, they are then able to uh, obtain a level four on that LPAC. They could then be considered in this last pathway, pathway three, for reclassification. Again, not an easy conversation because what we do understand is that, or what we would all hope that our teams would understand is that EL services, both integrated and designated, are so important to our English learners. And progress and the pathway towards progress is always much more important than coming to a conclusion where we remove all EL services. Albeit, I do have to say that should a student be reclassified, we also have a responsibility to monitor for four years thereafter to ensure that the student is continuing to be successful, that they receive the supports, adjustment scaffolds that they need to continue to be successful on their educational journey. But again, if there is a consideration for reclassification, these are the three pathways. For more information on reclassification, again, chapter nine of the English Learners of the California Practitioner's Guide for English Learners with Disabilities uh, would be a great resource for your teams. 
In addition, there are several resources there and scenarios that you could glean to for more information on reclassification. Uh, we also hope to have a video soon on our website regarding reclassification. And again, right now, amidst of COVID, we know that it's difficult not only to assess your students, but also to have these conversations regarding progress towards English language proficiency and the potential and all the considerations that go to prior to considering reclassification. So with that, because we know that we've shared so much with you, uh, we do wanna share some additional resources with you, the California Practitioner's Guide and all the corresponding resources and links that we shared with you today are found in our Padlet. Uh, we know that this was a very brisk walk through a very robust document, which is the California Practitioner's Guide and its appendices. We encourage you to refer to it, to please refer to our website as well, where we have videos posted regarding and referencing many of the chapters um, in the Practitioner's Guide that may be useful tools for you, as well as resources and padlets pertaining to those uh, video modules. Today, we hope that gave you opportunity to reflect, to determine where you'd like to start with the practitioner's guide because your participation and your attendance today tells us that again, you share in the passionate work that we have to improve outcomes for English learners. Again, feel free to reach out to us and contact us. Uh, we will go through a brisk walk. I'll stop sharing in just a minute so that you can visit or we can take you to a visit of our website as well as the Padlet and resources. I'm gonna lean on Vanessa because she's our super techie of the team. So she will walk you through our website quickly. And again, please reach out to us, follow us on Twitter and or email us directly. We do provide consultative supports and services to other SELPAs and county offices as well. So again, if there is an entry point that you wish to journey into as a district um, alongside your SELPA, we're here to support. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Vanessa, and she will take us into our website to give you a glimpse of where to find additional resources and additional videos uh, for your use. Again, please share and share um, as you see appropriate of all of the information that we have. I know, again, this was a quick walk, but I'll take let Vanessa take over. Uh, please know if you do need to log out, we completely understand. We know that there was some confusion. The invitation did say one to two o'clock, although our flyer did say one to three o'clock. So please know we will follow up with an email to all participants uh, with again, the Padlet, the recording, and a, please a request for your survey data results. Your feedback is very important to us. Go ahead, Ms. Vanessa. All right, everybody. So just a very quick walk through the different areas you may want to visit in our website. So we are housed within the Imperial County SELPA website. You will find all of our resources in this section. They are titled the same title as our grant, which is Improving Outcomes for English Learners with Disabilities. It is exactly here where you want to go. If you take a look at this section on my screen, that is the web address. I have dropped it in the chat box in case you want access to it. And I believe it is also included in the Padlet. Once you land on our homepage right here, you notice that by hovering on the menus, we go to training modules, training opportunities, resources, newsletter, and highlights. In our training modules page, you will find access to our various pre-recorded modules. And these include a variety of topics from administering the VCALPS to coaching for co-teachers and brick and mortar for virtual and blended environments, meeting the needs of English learners with disabilities, as well as the CLIM matrix, a session with Katie Novak on universal design for learning, and a variety of other topics. As you can see, all of these videos are readily available for you to watch within the website, or you may also open them up as a video in YouTube. You can also access materials and resources that are directly linked to that particular topic by clicking on the linked resources right here in this section. Returning to our drop down menu, we then go into training opportunities. It is here where you will find flyers for future opportunities and also past trainings. 
you'll find the bulk of our resources here in the aptly named resources tab. Um, by hovering, you can access either the practitioner's guide, the FAQs, EL roadmap information, ELD standards and framework, additional resources, resources specific to LPAC, SBAC, and our infographics. Quickly looking into the practitioner's guide page, you will find that we've actually taken the entirety of the practitioner's document, which is 492 pages, I believe, um, of incredible information, this huge compendium of, re of resources that are broken down into sections. So depending on your entry point, whatever area you are looking at expanding your own learning, or maybe uh, cementing some of your already um, um, had information, you can see that it's divided into five sections, sections one, two, three, four, and five. We go from identification of English learners, MTSS, pre-interventions, to pre-referral, referral assessment and the IEP process, education programs and instructional strategies, proposing exit from SPED services and reclassification. So whatever your entry point is, you can either delve into the document by clicking on the section that interests you, or if you choose to do it by chapter, you can do that as well. Additionally, on this page, we have the appendices. One of the questions that came up in the chat is, how do I access the appendices and how can I fill them up and save them? Well, here what we did is we took the appendices and we've just broken them up as individual standalone documents. That way, if you need to access a, a specific appendix, you can just click on it, it'll pop up. You can save locally, whether it be to your computer or your preferred location. You may fill it out, save it, print it, however you may want to use it. These are available for you. Also, we've taken apart the figures that we referenced in the document. These are broken up by chapter. So again, if there was a specific figure on a specific topic addressed in a chapter, you can follow this structure right here to find them. Returning to the drop down menu, we go to the FAQs. And again, the FAQs are those frequently asked questions that continue to arise in each section. So for example, if you have some reclassification questions and you don't want to dig through the entire document and you just want to see if the information you need is included here, you can go to the FAQ section and here are some frequently occurring questions that are related to that particular topic. And I apologize for giving some of you vertigo by scrolling up and down. Um, again, access to the roadmap, ELD standards and framework, additional resources. Here, I really want to call your attention to this section right here, because here is where we house some of our videos and padlets. So you are going to find additional resources here. So if the padlet that we provided with uh, you with today wasn't enough, guess what? We've got more. So we have additional padlets here that you can access, as well as videos that, again, you may view, share with a team. If you have a PLC structure that you are utilizing to grow your learning, you have access to additional resources here, as well as those put out by our, self, our partners in the CELPAs and the California Statewide System of Support. So if you're looking for information related to evidence-based practices for autism, we have Captain and Marin County's um, excellent uh, resource page right here, as well as open access for AT, UDL, and AAC system improvement leads, as well as equity disproportionality uh, also out of South County, as well as our additional collaborative partners, supporting inclusive practices, SIP, and additional resources that we have found useful as we embark on the work that we do in supporting students who are English learners with disabilities. Also on the resources tab, you will find information that is specific to the LPAC, um, being that we were uh, today touching on the sub subject of assessing students who are dually identified. Here you can have access to the accessibility resource graphics and additional information as it pertains to LPAC and alternate LPAC. Finally, if you access the very last section of the resources tab, you will have access to our infographics. We have additional infographics in the works. Currently, we have a couple of collaborative uh, infographics uh, that we developed, one being with Captain on aligning evidence-based practices, as well as strategies and supports identified in the California Practitioner's Guide as being 
useful and supported by evidence in the California Practitioner's Guide. So you have access to these uh, resource graphics, to these infographics that you can either use electronically or download and print or share. Finally, we have our newsletter and highlights. And in this newsletter and highlights section, you are going to be provided with additional information as well as the availability of signing up for our newsletter. So if you would like to receive additional information on um, whatever it is that we're sharing out based on the upcoming newsletter, and we have covered topics that directly relate to the needs of English learners with disabilities, just enter your information here and you will be added to our mailing list. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, thank you again to all of the participants. I know we still have 231 participants. Thank you to, for staying till the very end. Um, and again, I apologize for, again, the discrepancy in the time. We always have so much to share with you. So I hope that we provided you with all of the necessary resources, at least to assist you on your journey. And feel free, again, please reach out to your uh, respective SELPA director, your special education director, if you feel that we could potentially assist you uh, further in this work. We do support within the system of support, again, um, in support of CDE and CCEE and their work um, regarding English learners with disabilities. Um, we have many other presentations that we hope that we can see you and that you will join us with um, and hopefully again we can answer some of the questions that you have. I know there was questions in the chat box regarding the alternate LPAC and again because of its postponement yes you can administer your locally determined alternate. Please do defer to your respective DLACs and your EL master plan um, for information regarding the alternate assessment that's permissible within your respective LEA. And additionally, any reclassification uh, criteriums and what is part of your criterion two, three, and four. Again, please refer to your EL master plan as again, those are uh, locally determined facets for reclassification. Thank you so much. I see everyone in the chat box um, with recommendation with questions. And again, I will wait for some more questions. Again, I appreciate all of you. Thank you, John. I see John from CEC. Uh, thank you again for reaching out to us and hosting us. A big thank you to the California Council for Exceptional Children for hosting us today um, in their partnership, being able to provide all of you with information and again, a free resources for you all to use. Again, we're all just an email phone call away. So thank you again so much. Um, we typically stay till the last uh, participant leaves because we know that some folks like to actually ask questions in a small forum um, and we would like to give you an opportunity to do that as well. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.